Hi again, everyone. I'm Ollie Matthews. This is Refuge from Narcissism, and this refugee video is sponsored by contribution from Rex. And Rex just did a video, the Tyler Durden video, a few days ago. So <clears throat> let's hear his story. Dear Ollie, if you like, here's another contribution. I have to take it step by step. Still, I need to be cryptic or indirect at times. But this time, it is something where I have no problem to say that it happened, matter of fact. I had a discussion with a former friend once about a topic, and I tried to convey the message by talking through walls. That's a type, that's a type of code word, a very interesting topic in itself. But my cryptic style didn't convey the message, so I had to make it clearer. And I do so, and I do so now and it, now again. This time it's about torture. I just can't understand why people can't be more discreet or at least handle personal information or attempts to share difficult experiences with a sense of caution or try to make it easier for the other party not to have to spell everything out. As in a case of a former friend, it is a common annoyance with those people I still have contact with. But maybe I just but maybe I need to just get used to, to state information more clearly and slowly. Unfortunately, spelling everything out reduces mental distance and is really extremely difficult for me. <clears throat> I speak bluntly. Um, what you're talking about, you're talking about talking through war, wars or expecting people to read, read between the lines. You know, this is, it seems to me that this is another tactic you're using to protect yourself from blowback. And whether or not somebody's going to give you blowback, you're, you're not going to cushion that blow by flowery language and trying to talk around the issue and hope you could get them to see the issue on themselves. No, you got you to gotta lead them to the water. And whether they drink it or not, it's entirely up to them. And whether they get mad at you or not is entirely on them. You can't keep going through life worried about what everyone else's reaction is going to be to your feelings, to your opinions, and to your thoughts. You can't sugarcoat these things for people. You can't go through life looking just to sugarcoat so you don't have to so you don't have to get blowback. Because it doesn't seem like you're doing your sugarcoating or talking through walls as you're saying in order to protect their feelings. You're doing it in order to protect yourself from blowback. And when you do that, you're going to get blowback a hundred percent of the time. Every time. <clears throat> But since those beans were spilled in a discussion once already, that makes it also easier to talk about it now. So I picked it as the next topic. Within the preceding discussion with a former friend who had a weird hippie take. The status of this friend is subjected to no contact indefinitely, terminally discredited. His take was curious, though that people who end up in bad places where they face involuntary and inconvenient measures with intent to be broken basically did it to themselves due to their life or career choices. Can you believe it? An 80-year-old guy who blames people for getting tortured. I told him that people can end up in bad places despite their best efforts, despite doing everything right. And that hindsight is 2020, especially at younger ages. And that the idea of young people being tortured is particularly heartbreaking, even if they make mistakes. But as in this case, obviously, some people can reach the age of 80 without going through serious shit by sheer luck and then look down on others. What a luxury and curious case of boomer mommy, mommy syndrome. But such experiences made me even more cautious and increased my feeling, my in, increase me feeling discon, disconnected, as if it's not difficult enough for me to access that place in my memory. I have been the places, real places, where stuff gets real, and I don't like it if I have to spell out, spell everything out. As I said before, it makes me feel unsafe and vulnerable. And feeling unsafe and vulnerable. 
because you're so worried about blowback and attack. Okay. First of all, you shouldn't be you shouldn't be be trying to convince an 80 year old boomer of anything. Okay, their opinion and understand something. You gotta you gotta look at who you're dealing with and under and ask yourself the question: Why am I letting this boomer's opinion? Why am I letting this boomer's opinion upset me? Why am I letting this boomer's opinion hinder me? Because let me tell you something. The boomer has no problem saying whatever they want to say about you. So why are you then turning around and then and then showing them the respect of like, oh, I don't want to just come out and say it okay, because I don't want my feelings hurt. The boomer doesn't care if they hurt your feelings. They don't give a shit. And now you're dealing with some 80-year-old, 80-year-old German boomer who gives a sh- boomer hippie who gives a shit what they think. Going no contact and being an introvert and, and staying away from these people requires a thick skin. You have to have the attitude of this is my opinion, these are my experiences, this is how it affected me, and I don't care if you don't like it. Move on. When somebody's acting the way you're the, this boomer is at, that is a red flag. That is a that is a that is a telltale sign that says to you, keep me out of your life. There is this inner resistance, which is so strong, and writing is still the easiest path here. Fortunately, I can at least write again. I couldn't until this year due to my injuries. That's maybe also why I write so much. It's all stored up and needs to be written out of my system desperately, since talking about it verbally would be absolutely impossible. Yeah, see, man, you are so pent up. With all of this trauma you've dealt with, whatever it may be, because we, we haven't even gotten to the core of that yet, you want to get it out. You're not going to be able to get it out worrying about read, having people read between the lines or talking through walls. I would hit a mental concrete wall there, hence my attempts of talking through walls sometimes. So I will describe it as as much detail as I feel comfortable with right now, nothing more, nothing less. The listener may have to fill in some gaps. Talking through walls and still being understood, that would be nice, though. Not likely, I know. I will do my best, though, to reach around that wall. Let me tell you something. There is nothing freer. There is nothing more freeing and more validating than just being able to speak your mind. Speak your thoughts and speak your feelings. That's what you should be doing on this channel. This is your opportunity to say what you want to say, how you want to say it. So to the actual experience, there was a situation where I was injured and in much pain and basically helpless where I wasn't given anything to eat for at least 36 hours for no apparent reason. Sounds rather harmless, doesn't it? Usually I have no problem not eating anything, sometimes even for days. I like fasting once in a while to starve out spiritual laziness and intellectual confusion. And since my impairment doesn't allow me to burn a lot of calories, doesn't allow me to burn a lot of calories through sport and training anymore. For roughly 10 years now, I have to stick to a strict calorie control in order to prevent me from gaining weight. It is something I'm very particular about. But in that case, but in that case, this was different. I was given something without my noticing before the handing out of food was stopped. It was an agent or drug that caused severe hunger pains and cramps. So after 12 hours, these cramps started. It was so painful that attempts to describe it are useless. And I still have this pain in my back from preceding injuries as well. But that is almost, but that almost lost any impact. It was overridden by those hunger cramps. 
my nervous system somehow understood the situation naturally and i knew that the only way to stop this pain was to get something into my stomach i didn't anticipate any such shenanigans especially due to my injured state but as you said there are there is no weakness that the narc in his systems of control and abuse won't try to take advantage of even and especially if taking advantage of a pre-existing injury that causes much concern and weakness in itself so after a couple hours of trying to endure it i started asking them to give me something to eat Maybe after six six hours or so, but they wouldn't. They said they wouldn't have any. They wouldn't have anything to give me to eat, which makes no sense whatsoever. I believe I asked so many times that I lost count. With increasing desperation, since the hunger pains would only ever would only even ever increase. At some point, in a moment of silence, after 32 hours, I noticed there was a cold breeze going through that room where I was laying in a bed, basically immobilized, also due to the injury. I'm what, are you in a hospital or are you at home and this is your family taking care of you? <clears throat> Aside from that, I didn't know where the room was really located. I thought it was a room below ground till that moment. Then I realized that the room may actually be a third be a third or fourth level room. How did you, you don't know how you got into the room? My mind, see, this is the problem when you're trying to be cryptic and, and talk through walls. You, you gotta lay out the situation here without fear and let the cards fall where they may. <clears throat> My mind was only was only filled with the desire to get something into my stomach, even if it were only sawdust. The pain and the hunger became so unbearable that I started having visions to somehow get out of bed, run over to wherever that cold breeze was coming from, and jump out of that window to get out and possibly end that pain. I would feel that cold, wet grass below my feet while running away in my stupid clothes they gave me to wear. I thought based on that cold breeze that I could suddenly feel that cold, wet, short gra grass would surround the complex somehow. I feel this soft grass below my feet so intensely, but I couldn't move much really. I was stuck and I remained stuck for hours, kind of like your friend in your dream. I'm beginning to notice a theme here in what's going on in your head and what's going on with you. Somebody has trapped you. Somebody has you emotionally stunted, emotionally trapped. I made a last, last ditch attempt to ask them to give me something to eat, whatever it may be. I didn't care at this point, but they refused and told me again that they wouldn't understand why I was so hungry and they didn't have anything to eat. At that moment, I realized the futility of my situation and something cracked in me. Until that point, I could keep my composure for 34 hours or so. This time, it was like being frozen in time. Every minute felt like an hour, but these hunger cramps, with these hunger cramps and hunger pains, I counted every minute, every hour not to get insane in that situation, but it felt as if time wouldn't even pass. I was like frozen in time and the clock on the wall just wouldn't move. So at hour 35 when my demands to get at least something into my stomach to just alleviate the situation were was once more briefly denied, something cracked in me and I started sobbing like a newborn. I just couldn't com compute why this was done to this extent to me. When this happened, I felt so bad I can't describe it about myself see i don't understand i don't know what the injury is i don't know what this place is i don't know the people who are doing this to you it's you're not going you're not going to heal talking through walls ever you got to be clear about what's going on because you're not you're not going to heal talking through walls it's too cryptic When this happened, I felt so bad that I can't describe it about myself, that I lost composure and it was now acting like that, that I couldn't even control it. It was like a reflex, like those other reflexes that helped me in countless situations. 
Just here, my reflex was suddenly my enemy. I was very, very deeply ashamed. But because this wasn't bad enough, I could notice how they made fun of me in the background. See, a group of people would enter enter the room when I made my futile requests at times. And one person ran, one person, and one person out of that group would then come closer to me with my visual range. It was dark there. See, this almost sounds like, and I'm not making passing judgments here, Rex. This sounds like it's a, it's a, it's a mental hospital and that you're under some kind of mental uh, observation, some kind of suicide observation for a certain amount of time. If that's what it is, you should just say it. We should get get into that. Because what you're dealing with is the symptoms of what's hurting you, not the cause here. You're not going to get to the cause of your issues talking through walls as you as you describe it. I could only see that one person very roughly. The others, I don't even remotely know how they looked. I could just hear them talk and laugh and giggle. In particular, it was my last-ditch attempt. That person that usually came closer to my visual range would only claim they had nothing to eat after begging to give me something to eat. But I could only see a silhouette. Sounds like you're like restrained under suicide watch, is, is what this sounds like. And you might be embarrassed to tell me. I could be wrong. But it's hard to tell you what you're being cryptic about. What What is the injury? What is this place? Who are these people? I understand you need to talk through walls with other people. But if you try to talk through walls with me, you're not going to get anywhere. She was a woman based on what I could see and hear in her voice, but that's it really. Would I meet her today? I couldn't recognize her if she were standing next to me. So there I was sobbing like a child while these people in the background were laughing and making fun of me. I call that alone. I call that alone torture already. But despite my understanding this, I had a large chunk of my self-respect for that moment. For losing, I had lost a large chunk of my self-respect for that moment. For losing control, then a couple of minutes, four or five minutes later, suddenly that group and that woman would come back and give me something to eat. By the way, I know sometimes women are deliberately tasked in such situations, especially if the targeted person has macho traits, which I do have. It's done to humiliate. I don't know whether to use the use of a woman was deliberate or coincidental. I just can't exclude that possibility. So after she gave me something to eat, the pain started subsiding slowly. I was so desperate and hungry and tried that at first entire and tired that at first I didn't even notice that an hour later there was still stuff laying on under my legs. I had subconsciously put it there in order to not lose lose it out of my grasp for fear that they would start not giving me food again. My subconscious does this type of stuff. It is an automated survival response. When I'm in a stress, when I'm in stressful situations, my appetite shuts off roughly half the amount of my standard food intake. It's blocked then. I couldn't eat it, eat it even if I wanted to. I have to store it away and eat it later. So in this scenario, it dawned on to me that I also ate only half of what they gave me and that I kept the rest close to me not to lose it. I knew that I should somehow drop it or move it out of my very limited reach. It would be gone, giving them a chance to start the whole cycle even sooner if they wanted to. I fully realized having done this only when a couple hours later, I somehow became more conscious when those carbohydrates were processed properly in my body and my mind started working normally again. A couple hours later, when my condition substantially improved, it hap- I happened to meet a guy there. We got into a casual talk since he had to witness another situation of frankly torture of mine. But that's another story altogether. However, after a while, when I started to become able to speak properly again and to be able to articulate thoughts with words, I apologized to him for having to witness me shaking and wiggling around in pain for maybe 20 hours. Yeah, I think you're. this is in a hospital. It has to be. Has to be. 
So he couldn't sleep as well. You know, it's not nice having to witness someone in terror and pain. To someone, it is actually worse than being tortured themselves. That's how one breaks the soft and compassionate ones. I know effed up. But we had the opportunity to talk a little after the other ordeal, and I told him about this hunger pain situation from a couple of days ago. And I told him that those fucks there said that I couldn't understand why hunger caused so much pain and anguish. And he told me that, of course, you can trigger incredible hunger pains and cramps, either as a side effect of certain drugs or with specific drugs. He was actually a medic. So there it was as, as plain truth. And that's what I was thinking as well. I think it might have been some type of medication. But you said you were there for an injury. So the medication might have been for your injury. And based on your past abuse, again, you're coming to me with the symptoms and not giving me any history as to the cause. Because there is a cause to all this. You can cause any person such unbearable hunger pains. It's not, it's not complicated. Another indicator showing that these fucks not only enjoyed to cause me the situation, but also attempted to mess with my brain by claiming the pain was inexplicable or maybe even not bad or real to condition me into thinking that I was the cause of the problem. But hunger, but hunger torture, unfortunately, is a real thing. And I hope this doesn't give people bad ideas see hunger torture doesn't leave marks actually it does though but not very obvious types sometimes the nervous system of the digestive tract and stomach of mine was damaged by this and now i almost don't feel any hunger even if i don't eat anything for hours and days i think this is all subconscious reactions to whatever you whatever you've gone through rex so you got to deal you got to get to the core of your issues and you're dealing with the sniffles of your the runny nose the sniffles the the sore throat and you're not dealing with the actual infection seems those receptors were damaged or desensitized and i have to eat stuff that comes pretty close to wet sawdust every day in order to keep digestion run digestion running somewhat normally i had to try to find i had to try and find ways to regenerate my digestion after this this is a solution i had to come up with to somewhat resolve digestive problems that i didn't have to such an extent it wasn't like that before this event. Even after a longer time, I still don't feel the hunger sensation increasing, so it can happen that I just forget to eat. I have the same problem with heat. I don't feel it when I'm overheated, but that's another topic. But irrespective of all this, the worst was and it is, and is that I felt so ashamed for losing my composure in that situation. And frankly, if I recall the situation now, which I... Which I prefer usually not to, I still feel deeply ashamed over my sobbing uncontrollably. I know that this is intense hunger cramp and had not been caused by some drug. It's not that you were sobbing over the hunger pain. You were sobbing over not being listened to, over how you were being treated, over the lack of control you had. I know they refused to give me anything to eat despite my asking and begging them repeatedly. I know they made fun of me and laughed at me in that situation, especially when I lost composure for a couple minutes toward the end of the ordeal. Yet I still feel ashamed for having given in and displaying weakness like that. For all those years from my childhood, throughout my adolescence, my 16 years of hell, my self-respect kept me fighting this pain caused by my injuries of mine and the resulting destruction of my life. That was the only thing I had to be proud of, even while falling away from all that I cared about my life, that I wouldn't give up and continue to fight this destruction and debilitating pain with all I could muster. When I saw others in similar situations take their lives, I would just continue. I'm not judging anybody here. I don't judge people going through terrible ordeals for taking their lives. See, this sounds like you were under suicide watch. It does. And if you were, like, you should just come out and say it and we deal with, we deal with your past. 
Rather, I feel sorry for them and compassionate. It's just that I am and was just so thankful for some reason that I can't ex- can't even 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 I can't explain even myself that I had this self-respect that made me fight this with all my capacities for 15 or 16 years and not take this life of mine. It is somehow hardwired into me. Another story again. My self-respect is like a friend to me that is always there in any situation and tells me that I have to fight this and just continue and point and point at and at and I'm sorry. <clears throat> My self-respect is like a friend to me that is always there in any situation and tells me that I have to fight this and just continue and that at some point it is going to be all right. Who is always who is always there for me when I need him? Who keeps my spirit up? Who tells me that he needs, that he knows that I'm tough, but that I just need to continue for another minute, hour, or day, and at some point that it'll be all right. Kind of like you were doing in your friend to in your dream with your friend who is injured. You don't see these same scenarios keep playing out, whether in your mind or in reality. And now your self-respect is your friend. Was it your self-respect that you were dealing with in that in that dream from the last video? Who gives me solace and turmoil and calmness and anguish, or at least offers it cordially? I am f- I am free to decline, but that's not me. So I'm very thankful for this self-respect. I don't know where it's coming from. I don't claim I deserve it, nor nor that is it of my own doing. Maybe it's one of those forces of nature working in me that I can't even explain myself. Sometimes these forces of nature can slightly show through and get registered by the environment. That's when people, even the allegedly strong and mighty ones, back off. So interestingly, even as a child or adolescent, I was never physically threatened or physically bullied. Another story, though. But I only feel the presence of this trusted friend called self-respect when I don't do anything that would silence his voice. Listening to this self-respect is the reason why I'm still alive or not injured to even greater degrees. When I started sobbing after 35 hours of not having any food and after 23 hours of increasing hunger pains and cramps, it felt like I had hurt that trusted friend. That I silenced them unjustly, I, and I am deeply ashamed about this. So, so much indeed for that for weeks, sometimes even months, I don't remember this and think about this situation. But I believe this is the reason why I'm so obsessed with over keeping my self respect intact. I want to be thankful to this trusted friend and not silence him, his friendly still voice that I keep keep me alive in these horrible situations. But are you are you trying not to upset your friend's self respect by talking through walls? Because if that's what you're doing, your friend's self respect isn't your friend. Your friend's self respect, what you think is self respect, is your anchor and your enemy. When others were giving up on me and my situation or didn't care in the first place, he was always there. And I felt so bad for not reciprocating and doing something that may have silenced him when I started sobbing due to the hopelessness of this situation and pain and with this hunger, pain and cramps. This isn't a real person, though. This is in your mind. This is in your head. When I believe or at least suspect that I did something that may compromise or silence my self-respect, even in unintentionally, this triggers these types of memories in me that usually I would not rather, I would rather not remember. You need to remember. See, this is what I'm telling you. Whatever this is, whatever you think this is, this self-respect is not self-respect. It's avoiding you from dealing with whatever's really damaging you. And this is why you're talking through walls to people. You're not going to get any better talking through walls. And this wasn't the only occasion of 
of this type of magnitude. There happened, there happened a number of those to me. It wasn't a singular event at all. Self-respect. So yes, when I, when I am afraid that I could silence this voice of my trusted friend called self-respect by doing or allowing something that may compromise him, I tend to become even more vigilant and protective and even more reserved as I never know to which degree I may compromise my self-respect and whether the damage is permanent. And since I need my self-respect to stay alive, this is something that gets me into alarmed and concerned state. The craziest part, the craziest part about this situation is that I don't even hate those people who did this to me. I mean, what I described at this time, I don't know exactly why it was done. I just feel indifferent. Do you know why you were there? What are your injuries? This is what I'm talking about. Without knowing what the actual situation is, I can't, it's hard. And it tells me that something in your head is what's, is what's damaging you. When it comes to torture, even serious ones, maybe the first and second occasion one feels anger or hate. But when situations are happening repeatedly, maybe over extended periods of time, there is just indifference towards these people. The why loses all meaning. Indeed, the why can become become a dangerous weapon for the enemy. He wants to make his why into yours as well. And in that case, he wins and you lose. Being comfortable Being confronted with the inconvenient situation repeatedly erodes the will to hate those people that inflict such pain. So after a while, it starts feeling more like confronted with a force of nature. You can't be angry at a hurricane, but the pain that is inflicted changes perception of your body as something positive that you own into a battlefield of forces of of nature that own you. Pain becomes a force of nature. Resistance becomes a force of nature. Your individuality becomes a force of nature. Your thoughts and feelings become a force of nature. Fear becomes a force of nature. And especially communication becomes a force of nature. The most dangerous of them all. So there is this playing field inside at a certain point, and one is forced to observe how these forces of nature battle against and interact with each other. So a number of so so after a number of such experiences, anger at individuals subsides and gives way to a weird curiosity and boredom along those lines of, so will I drown this time? What is going what is it going to be this time? Who is look who is talking? Unfortunately, not in funny ways. Not most of the time at least. One can try to use humor to deal with it, so I did at times, but it's just not funny in itself. It it never will be. So these experiences are, are what they are. I can't reverse those since, since time itself is a force of nature at this place as well. Yes, I've been to places. I've become in, an involuntary expert for something in which the term to describe it has no real meaning for most people. I, this sounds like you're talking. I mean, are you talking from right now? Are you living in a facility right now? Because this seems, this is what it seems like, the involuntary, the, again, it's high, it's going to be very hard to help you if you're going to talk to me through walls, and you're going to talk to this community through walls. You just have to say it, okay, because this self-respect that you think is your friend and you think it's self-respect isn't. It's holding you back from whatever it is. Everybody needs self-respect. I'm not saying, oh, fuck self. No, but it's not self-respect. Whatever this is, is not self-respect. It's your anchor. At least I can claim that I didn't want expertise on this field, but something else entirely, and that this proves that there is still some honor and dignity left within me. To me, it does. Nevertheless, and inevitably, this ugliness has also become part of my identity. 
in any case, at times I would really appreciate to gain back more agency so I can work out past experiences productively and gain back a modicum of freedom so I can at least compensate with whatever harmlessly crazy activity that comes to mind, as anyone else does, goddammit physically and also mentally. For example, something crazy like to play a melody with the eyes. Maybe those messages are an attempt to get there, but I still feel as if I can only talk through walls, even now. Don't knock twice, don't knock thrice, idiot. And if you want to get through this, knock five times, only five times, slowly and rhythmically, and then be silent and just listen. Anybody there? No, man. No, not talking like this because I still don't really know what's going on here because you're talking so cryptically. Okay, there's no shame here. If it's some kind of mental facility, if it's some kind of assisted living facility, you need to tell us that. You need to let me know how you got there, what your past is, because this is, you know, this is you're coming to me with symptoms and not the cause of what's damaging you. You're never going to heal talking through walls, Rex. Okay? And you're going to have to get to a point. You're going to have to where you're just going to be able to say what happened, what you think, what you feel bluntly and clearly and without worry of what people are going to say back to you. And the last thing you should, and the last person you should worry about, its opinion, is some 80-year-old hippie boomer. So, I hope that helps. Thank you so much for another contribution in Story Rex. I really appreciate it. Thank you to everybody watching. Please leave any opinions or advice in the comment section below. And again, if you want your story read on the channel, you have a topic you'd like me to cover, something you'd like to expose, you'd like to set up a Skype phone call, have a private video made, you'd like to sponsor a video like this for someone who needs help and can't afford it, or just make a contribution to the channel in general to keep it supported, growing, and successful, because this channel survives 100% on contributions from all of you. Without you guys, all of this goes away. So if you like what you see here and you want to see more videos like this, you know what to do with the PayPal, Zelle, or e and cash app links in the description box also please like and share this video wherever you can subscribe to my channel if you haven't and be sure to click the subscription bell to be notified of all my video uploads i'm ollie matthews this has been refuge from narcissism take care everyone